Welcome to the Changelog episode 0.7.1. I'm Adam Stachowiak. And I'm Wynne Nedlin. This is the Changelog. We cover what's fresh and new in open source. If you found us on iTunes, we're also on the web at thechangelog.com. We're also up on GitHub. Head to github.com slash explore. You'll find some trend repos, some feature repos from our blog, as well as the audio podcast. And if you're on Twitter, follow Changelog Show. And me, Adam Stack. And I'm Penguin, P-E-N-G-W-I-N-N. Fun episode this week. Talk to Alex McCall from Twitter. He's known for Spine, which is uh, an alternative to Backbone. So these single-page JavaScript apps are really catching on. Yeah. This is, a, this is a fun little conversation you guys had here. It wasn't too long, though, was it? No, it's a couple of weeks back. You know, the original version of Spine was in JavaScript. He's rewritten it in CoffeeScript. So if you sling the coffee, you'll be interested in, in checking out Spine. And also a little controversy if Nathan Smith is listening to this. <laughs> That's true. Friend of the show. Yeah. You know, a lot of things going over at GitHub these days. We need to get these guys back on the show to talk about some of their uh, recent hires and acquisitions. I mean, it would be nice to talk about, uh, was it Hubot as well? That's a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, Hubot, I guess that's how you pronounce it, uh, reads Hubbot. It's the um, you know, GitHub robot for Campfire. But they have adapters for, we use it for HipChat, but they have it for uh, various numbers of real-time uh, chat tools, I guess IRC probably as well. Got to get them back on the show. Yeah, especially uh, you know they're they're reaching out into uh, the .NET world. And, you know, Azure or Azure is now on uh, GitHub, so hopefully we can talk about some .NET and open source and some NuGet. <laughs> some NuGet, yeah, we did talk about NuGet uh, a while back, so we do need to talk about that. Yeah, fun episode this week. Should we get to it? Let's do it. Chatting today with Alex McCall from Twitter. He's the author of the Spine JS project and some other things. So, Alex, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more about what you do at Twitter? Well, um, I work on the front end at Twitter, um, and I do all sorts of JavaScript and uh, Ruby stuff with the ad platform. And in my spare time, I do Spine, and I also travel and write. Um, I've written a few books for O'Reilly, um, and in fact, a new one is coming out in December. Um, I've just moved from uh, England to San Francisco, and I've actually just started at Twitter. I've only been here for two weeks. Well, welcome. Congratulations on the move. So I guess the obvious question up front when we're talking about Spine is, what relation, if any, does it have to Backbone? Well, Spine was inspired by Backbone. Um, and yeah, without Backbone, there would be no Spine. Uh, and obviously, you can tell by the name that it's uh, uh, that, that it's related. Um However, Spine does ta- have a different take on uh, JavaScript web applications and moving state to the client side. Uh, it's got a completely different model API. Uh, it's got this whole asynchronous UI approach. Uh, so there's, th- there is a similarity there, but there's also quite big differences. What's, what's propelling this movement to moving everything to the client in the last few years, this trend that we've got with client-side JavaScript applications? What, what seems to be the technol- technical advances under the hood there that's just empowering this well um we've got amazing browsers now we've got amazing vms um, and v8 for example chrome uh we've got a sort of browser war which is propelling uh software companies like apple and google to compete and and improve their browsers uh and it's all in the aim of a better user experience uh these client-side web apps are just really fast um and i think that's at the end of the game that's what it's about it's about speed now spine's written in CoffeeScript, right uh, that's correct, yes. Was the first version, was it CoffeeScript from the get-go? or No, it was JavaScript originally, and then I ported it to CoffeeScript. Uh, because at the time, I just uh, didn't know about CoffeeScript. What uh, niceties have you found along the way? Well, uh, it's much smaller. Uh, well, I mean, at least the CoffeeScript is smaller. The compiled source is about the same size. Um, and CoffeeScript has a ton of a really nice language features. Um, that stop you, A, making stupid mistakes. Um, it sort of uses the, a small subset of JavaScript, so uh, it uses the good parts. Uh, so you can uh, avoid having things like semicolons and, uh, and global variables. It'll sort all that for you. And, and I found that that's really useful when I've been programming. Um, and I, I, I wish uh, I could use... Actually, I better not say that, sorry. Um, I wish I could never write JavaScript again and just use CoffeeScript uh, because I love it so much. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I use it every day. 
Let's talk a bit about MVC and how it may be different than some of the uh, the MVC frameworks for web apps on the server. Um, when we talk about MVC in a client side Java application, a JavaScript application rather, um, are the views really views? Or are they in the case of Backbone? Or no, they're really more or less view controllers. What, what's a view in in Spine? Well, I guess it's just a terminology thing. Uh, in Spine, I call a template a view. Um, whether that be an uh, echo template or a moustache template. Uh, in Backbone, uh, views have are more like spines controllers, um, and it's just more of a terminology thing. So if we were doing a, a mind map between the two, just to, for those that may have Backbone experience, um, so if a view in Backbone is a template, or a controller rather, in, in spine, what's the uh, correlation between routers and routers? Uh, routers and routers, well, Spine doesn't really have um, a separate class uh, f- to do with routers. You, you do routing inside your um, controller. Oh, okay, so much less, um, more like the Sinatra pattern then, rather. That's correct, yes. You mentioned Eco. Is that your favorite templating? It is. Um, again, it's uh, one of my, the reasons is because the syntax is CoffeeScript. Um, and also, uh, if you have a look at the source of Eco, uh, it's it's really clean. It's really nice, um, and this is something that a lot of templating libraries have a, have an issue with. Um, the, the, if you look at what's going on behind the scenes, it's pretty nasty, and that's not the case with Eco. You know, one of the advantages or the promises of Mustache is to use your the same templating uh, project server side and client side. Is that a kind of a false goal? I think it's a bit of a pipe dream. Um, I mean, I, I guess I view it the same as using models uh, on the client side and the server side. And it would be great if that was the case, but I haven't really seen a, a practical um, application actually using that um, because at the end of the day, you're always going to have some differences. Um, and I think what is a little shame about Moustache is that because they've gone down that route, it limit, limits their syntax somewhat. Uh, because they have to be compliant across all these different languages. Um, and if you're not using um, the, the the template on both the server and client side, then there's no point having uh, the syntax limitations. So on the Spine project page, you outline the integration with Rails and the asset pipeline. Mm-hmm. Um, talk a bit about how that sets up and, and what that looks like. Uh, well, it's so simple with Rails. Uh, it, it integrates with Rails generators, uh, Rails Asset Pipeline. Um, we're just basically piping in um, Spine's JavaScript. Um, and when you do Rails generate Spine new, uh, it will create a new Spine application in the app assets JavaScript folder. Uh, and everything is set up there for you. And then you can generate new controllers and models. And the great thing is, if you set up a, a Rails scaffold and you set up a Spine model on the front end, uh, the two will talk to each other straight away. Um, so Spine sort of works with Rails out of the box. And you've got the same generators for Spine objects as well, controllers, views, and scaffolds? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, you can also generate Spine scaffold, uh, which will integrate with the Rails scaffold um, over Ajax. You also mentioned Hem. Mm-hmm. Is that your preferred platform or... Well, if you're not integrating with Rails, then that is my preferred platform. Uh, it's Hem is... Uh, not to be used in production, it's just uh, in development, and then you can serve static files in production. But basically what it is, is like Bundler for Node applications, uh, and it will pull out, you can have NPM dependencies, and you can have local dependencies, and it will pull all those out together and compile them into one JavaScript file, and it also manages your CSS. Um, and so that is my preferred method. If you're not going with Rails and you just want to, do, to build a Node app, uh, or you're building like a mobile app, uh, then just use Hem. Are you doing a lot of Node development? I do. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a developer here called Michael Jackson, and we're working on a new f- uh, web framework called Strata, uh, which is going to uh, replace Express in some of our projects. And we're also working with a lot of Node and Fibers and trying to uh, reduce the asynchronous um, uh, pattern style in Node, you, you know, you, you get into callback hell. And so Michael and I have been working a lot with Node to try, to try and solve that it problem. So what powers the real-time aspect of Spine? 
Um, well, Spine isn't inherently real-time. Um, in fact, yeah, you just need to add uh, real-time support to it. Um, uh, it's, it's the same with Backbone. Uh, if you have views that are bound to your models, then adding real-time support is, is pretty simple. All you have to do is update the models, and then your uh, interface automatically updates. So there's no inherent, uh, I guess, pusher or socket IO support. It's just... That's that's correct. And, uh, I mean, in a lot of Spine examples, I've used a, uh, a RPC framework, or, my, or you could call it PubSub framework, uh, called Jugnaut, which I produced a few years earlier. Um, and uh, basically, your Ruby models, you just have a, an observer, and uh, that will basically send messages to Juggernaut saying, this model's changed, these are new attributes. Juggernaut will send it out to all the clients. All the clients have to do is update their models, and then their views automatically update. So adding real-time support is, is literally like five minutes. What type of applications are you building with Spine? Well, um, the main reason I uh, developed Spine was for this uh, guide app. I'm trying to digitize the Lonely Planets and put them on the iPhone and on the iPad and the desktop. Um, and so this app basically lets you select countries, places, locations, and look at reviews and photos. Uh, and it's quite simple, but uh, it's a good um, uh, stepping stone for, for other Spine applications. You mentioned local storage here on the Spine project page. Um, what other storage mechanisms does Spine support? So Spine out of the box supports local storage and AJAX. Um, and with local storage, it's just a case of including that in your models, uh, sorry, including a line of code which imports the local storage uh, module. And that'll um, persist it when the page closes. That'll persist all the model data. And when you reopen the page, it'll all be there and populated. Um, and AJAX is similar. You import the AJAX module and give it an endpoint, and Spine will basically just use uh, standard REST um, calls like post, put, get on that AJAX endpoint to persist your data. Talk a bit about Spine.app. So Spine.app um, integrates with HEM, and it's basically just a Spine application generator. Um, and you just do Spine.app app, uh, and it'll generate your app, it'll generate all the directory structure, your, your MVC, your, your controllers, your views, um, and your models, and it'll generate public directory, and it'll deal with all your uh, CSS. And Spine.app is actually very useful when it comes to building mobile apps, because Spine has this Spine mobile project, ex uh, sort of extension to Spine, and Spine.app um, basically will generate uh, that mobile uh, project directory for you, which you can then sort of wrap up with PhoneGap. So PhoneGap, is that your preferred method for wrapping these for uh, the App Store? Uh, that or is, the Android Marketplace? Yeah, that is that is my preferred method, um, mostly because I just haven't looked at other alternatives, um, but, but it works very well for me. I'm a titanium guy myself, but uh, there's no, no reason why you couldn't take an HTML5 application like this and wrap it in, uh, in titanium as well. You know, it's I'm wondering, once we have a truly position fix mechanism to have a toolbar at the bottom of the page, and iOS 5 supports this, how much more use we'll have for native platforms if we want to just circumvent the app stores and Android marketplaces and just publish our apps? Well, well, that's right. I mean, iOS 5 fixed the biggest issue, which was um, with the scrolling. So now you can have fixed headers and footers. Um, and the only other reason uh, that I'm using uh, PhoneGap and integrating into the, phone, uh, the marketplace is because I want to access some of the payment APIs, and that's the only way to do it. Um, but if I was just building a, um, a, web, a mobile web app uh, the, uh, without needing to do access any of the native APIs, then definitely that's what I would do. I would just uh, use pure HTML and host it myself. What range of devices are you aiming to support? Uh, at the moment, uh, it's it's iPhone. Um, Android's uh, WebKit browser is not up to scratch. Um, and, you know, the, the transitions look uh, jumpy and, uh, and 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 it just doesn't feel great, to be honest. Um, and I I think in a few months' time, maybe half a year's time, uh, Android support will be amazing. Uh, and then it'll both you can write once and deploy everywhere. That's the idea. What type of user interface are you employing in your applications? I know when a lot of HTML5 apps try to mimic 
native applications, they fall quite short. And so should we just be building something entirely different? Well, I, I think that's a bit of an excuse uh, to build something a bit crapper. Uh, I think it's fine if you're building something uh, completely different, uh, as long as it's uh, as good or better than the native experience. But I find that's often used as an excuse. Uh, and certainly, uh, I've built web apps, mobile web apps, that uh, are very difficult to tell they're not native. Uh, you can emulate pretty much everything. You can emulate the transitions, you can emulate all the CSS styles for the header and footer, uh, and it looks practically identical. So you're still doing the, the drill down, stack controllers type of user interface, the uh, UI table controller type on the iOS, iOS platform, that sort of paradigm? Well, you, what you mean, uh, having tabs and um, views that sort of flip in and out? I know that like the drill down where you have a table of options and you click one and it slides... Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I, I'm using that, uh, and that works great on mobile um, for mobile interfaces. So you're writing a CoffeeScript book. Yes, it's called uh, The Little Book on CoffeeScript, and it was actually open-sourced a while back. Um, but O'Reilly uh, have recently approached me to publish it, and it's going to be uh, free online through O'Reilly's site, but, and you'll be able to pay for a printed version if you want one. So what did you learn writing this book? Well, I mean, uh, one of the best ways of um, of learning is is teaching, right? And uh, and so I learned a hell of a lot about CoffeeScript just by writing the book. Um, and also, I learned a lot about CoffeeScript style. I was lucky enough to get Jeremy, the the um, creator of CoffeeScript, to go through the book, and in fact, he's writing one of the chapters. Um, and so he taught me a lot about CoffeeScript style and what I should and shouldn't do, and and it makes a lot of sense. Maybe give us a couple of, of pointers on that. What makes good CoffeeScript style? For example, using and instead of double ampersand. It just reads much better. What about parentheses? Yeah, you don't... Um, uh, drop when optional? Yeah, I, I would uh, drop parentheses and, unless you need to make it uh, obvious. Unless it's not obvious of what's going on. Um, and sometimes if you've got like three or four nestled uh, function calls, then you definitely want to use uh, parentheses. We've also got another book for O'Reilly, mm -hmm. JavaScript Web Apps. Yeah. Talk a bit about that one. Well, I wrote this as I was uh, traveling. Um, and um, it's, it's a book about building JavaScript web applications and moving state to the client side. And the main part of the book is MVC. And we take you through um, building... A model view controller interfaces. It's not uh, language or library specific. Um, all the examples at the end, uh, you have they have spine examples at the end um, and backbone examples and JavaScript MVC. But throughout the book, uh, it's it's generic. What are some of the gotchas of building single page web apps that uh, maintain state on the client? Well, it's it's a lot of work, and it's also a big paradigm shift. It's a quite hard for a lot of developers to get their head around. Um, you have to move all the rendering to the client, uh, and it's very difficult to convert an existing app into using this sort of architecture. Um, usually, you have to start from scratch. Uh, so it's a lot of work, but I think the advantages are worth it. Um, the, the really quick UI that you get from it is worth it. So what is an architecture for these types of applications look like? Uh, you normally just uh, build out an API first and then build out a user interface on top of that, or do you still step out the design first? What I do is I start straight out with the design, do the CSS and HTML, and then um, I, I do the models client-side, and I basically stub out the data for them. Um, and I get working everything working client side because at the end of the day that's what matters. And then once all that's done, um, then I do look at the server side, and I have a much better idea of what models and API I need on the server side once the client side is finished. What tools do you have to debug these applications on mobile? Um, I usually just um, use Safari and Chrome um, to develop them, um, and sometimes the um, uh, iOS simulator. Uh, and, that, and that's enough for me. I just use the web inspector. Are you building applications that install to the home screen? And do you do anything special um, with the meta tags that you can do to, to make a full screen application on iOS? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for example, Spy Mobile comes with a default set of meta tags that prevent you sort of zooming in and uh, set the page title, the page icon, and that sort of thing. And definitely I'm using those in all sorts of applications. 
You mentioned async earlier. What problems does async, um, I guess, present when you're building an async UI? Well, again, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so the idea is that you never block the user. So they interact with you with your application and you never block uh, their interaction. So let's say they are sending an email. In Gmail, when you click send an email, it waits like two or three seconds uh, saying sending your email. And I'm saying that uh, you either lie to the user or in the case of email, you just put it in the outbox like you would in an IMAP client and you don't block the UI. Uh, because I think that's a really bad user experience. So when you're building out your views in Spine, are you taking advantage of JST uh, just in Rails or uh, Yes, I'm just in Rails. Um, I mean, when it comes to HAM, you can just use uh, common JS modules rather than use sprockets. So do you find yourself always passing data across the wire and, and bind to that, or do you ever pass markup across the wire? Uh, always data, just uh, JSON data. Uh, if you start passing markup across the wire, then you haven't got an asynchronous interface because you rely on the server uh, to render the page. So if somebody updates, let's say adds a new comment to a blog post, uh, the server has got to re respond with that markup, whereas if you were rendering everything client-side, you could display it instantly. So you guys still hiring at Twitter? Yes, we are. We are hiring... Um, Every day, every day we've got new people interviewing, uh, and if you're interested in working uh, here, then you should definitely get in touch. Uh, it's a great team, um, and and it's a really interesting company because there's some really big problems to work on. One last question: So, what open source project out there just has you excited that you want to play with? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, I, I think it would. Um, we edit this out, but I think it would it would be um, Strata, but we've already talked about that. Um, I'll throw another curveball at you. Who's your programming hero? Uh, Jeremy Ashenkanis would definitely be him. Uh, yeah, that guy has created Backbone and CoffeeScript. I think that's incredible. He is a programming stud, that's for sure. Well, thanks, Alex, for joining us, and good luck at Twitter. We look forward to seeing the Coffee Book, uh, Coffee Script book out this. I guess later this, for the end of the year or early next year? Uh, in December. In December. We'll keep an eye out for that. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much.